Okay, welcome everybody. We can begin now. A few more people will probably be joining us. But I just wanted to say welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Brianna Delaval. I'm a student here at Chandler Gilbert Community College, and I will be transferring to U of A next spring. And I hope to study a little bit about cognitive science and music and philosophy. So I'm super excited about today's presentation. Um, and we'll be joined by Janice Jarrett, and the presentation will be about the science of music, which I think is extremely fascinating. And a couple housekeeping rules. Remember to practice kindness. Please follow our community guidelines for engaging on comments. We don't tolerate bullying, harassment, or hate speech. And stay engaged. You can drop questions in the comments throughout the presentation, and we'll be addressing them at the end. And then uh, for students, an attendance link will be available at the end of the event if this is a co-curricular activity, and you can click on the link to mark as completed. So thank you, and I will introduce Janice Jarrett. So Janice is a jazz singer, lyricist, arranger, band leader, speaker, and journalist. She has taught and performed across the country and abroad. She earned her Bachelor of Arts in Voice and Composition at Antioch College and both her master's world in world music and PhD in ethnomusicology at Wesleyan University. As a journalist, she's the, um, her profiles and reviews have appeared in periodicals and newspapers, and she's the owner and instructor at Vocal Technique Studio in Tucson, where she offers voice lessons, music theory, songwriting, and other musicianship skills. So thank you, and without further ado, I present to you Janice Jarrett. Hi, um, it's uh, the science of music and the music of science. So it's, it's how much they overlap. I start with the quote from uh, Einstein, which is, I repeat at the end because it maybe it makes more sense then, but we are slowed down sound and light waves, a walking bundle of frequencies tuned into the cosmos. We are souls dressed up in sacred biochemical garments and our bodies are the instruments through which our souls play their music. It sounds very poetic and very eloquent, but it's actually one of the ways, music has been one of the ways that he's felt like he understood the cosmos. Um, like the Joni Mitchell song, we are stardust. We are made of the elementary particles that the stars are made of as carbon-based beings. And we're made up of, um, a different combination of them. And I was watching uh, a Nova last night about the ice planets and they talk about the different planets or the different stars and what they have, what percentage of things they have in them. And they're measuring different components of the elementary particles that they have. Are, um, so they have deciphered elementary particles and defined as much of the universe as they can through mathematical formulas. Einstein's MC squared is uh, very famous and not surprising from scientists, from astro astrophysicists to quantum theorists, the common base is mathematics, measurements and formulas. They're everywhere in music too. The frequencies are different speeds of our vibrations for pitches, our rhythmic durations, formulas for building numbered steps and scales and chords. We measure intervals between pitches played together or in sequence. Um, we assign tempos fast or slow with numbers. We count how many measures in a section in a piece of music. Um, what we call chord progressions are based on formulas by the, that uh, you, we use to create a song's harmony. And we can even recognize songs from their chord progressions often, um, which means just what chords are played in sequence. The most illuminating key for me though, to better understand the science and music is a simple idea. It's the idea of the sound wave, um, part of a spectrum of light and sound vibrations that the scientists have learned to define and quantify for us. And music is made out of waves of sound. The most basic way to show a frequency of vibration is the sine wave. And that's the second, um, you've got it. Boy, you're good at this. <laughs> that's perfect. So that's the basic thing. Um, and Sound waves can, merit, uh, can be measured for their intensities, for their size, how fast or slow they are, how loud, how much compression. It moves through a, through a medium, through space, through air, 
and it compresses and expands as the waves radiate out. So if you th just think of a rock thrown in water, or, you're <laughs> or if you've never, I'm sure you've been next to a car that is actually a boombox at a red light, and you can feel the vibrations through your car <laughs> of what low pitches that they are projecting. So the scientists' exploration of the physical structures through mathematical formulas follow their urge to not only know what our world is made of, but how it works. And this thirst for understanding has given us so many amazing things, we can take them for granted. So the quantification or turning matter and phenomena into numbers, measurements, relationships, and formulas is how we have today's electricity, our radios, our TV, to capture and transmit waves, our computers, our nanocomputers, our multiple communication systems, smart gadgets, and all. We have drones, even cosmic drones that go um, millions of miles away. We create robots, robots that go into outer space. And there's one in my dining room my sisters gave me for Christmas, the iRobot, which my daughter teased me online for saying, I followed it around talking to it. <laughs> so, so we have robots everywhere. And now we have micro microscopes that see inside matter and telescopes that see beyond our eyes. So they can not only see distant stars, they can compute the locations and accurate sizes of planets they can't even see. I'll explain that later. And the stars they circle. We learned that we are not only in a galaxy of stars, that our Milky Way is not the only gal galaxy. These discoveries in the macro and micro worlds revealed what the ancient scientists could never even dream of. But, uh, and there, there's a, not yet, <laughs> but that shows you, that's good. Um, but there, the connection of music and science was uh, even very firmly established 2,500 years ago. Pythagoras, famous for his geometric studies, divided a string and learned about pitches. You may have seen a guitarist do the same thing, uh, make a, uh, do the same thing that Pythagoras did. When they touch a string and the string is cut in half or in a, in a proportion or a ratio, they touch it and they deaden part of the vibration and excite the rest of the string. And it's a shorter string, so it gets a higher pitch. We call those harmonics. And you've heard them go beyond the pitches that are in the strings that are plucked or fretted on the fret. They go even higher than that. So those are called the harmonics. But he divided the string into different uh, wavelengths and got different uh, pitches. And what happened? Let's see, where is this? He was born on the island of Samos, Greece in 569 BC. He played the lyre. He knew poetry. He recited Homer. Besides music and astronomy, he was interested in mathematics and philosophy. And to the ancients, music and another early, music and um, astronomy, another early science, were inseparable. And Pythagoras believed all things are numbers, and geometry was the highest form of mathematical study. Like other ancients, he thought the Earth was the center of the universe, and he remains but he remains important because of his geometric discoveries and for his scientific experiments dividing the string, the vibrating string. How that happened was one day he passed a barbershop uh, a blacksmith, sorry, not a barbershop, a blacksmith shop, and he noticed that two different hammers had two different pitches. One was twice as heavy as the other, he discovered. So he, could, so he divided a string in half, and he found that the pitches had the same relationship that he heard in the hammers. So when he used the ratio of two to one, he discovered what we call the octave. So for the higher pitch, half the string was vibrating twice as fast. His mathematical experiments with dividing the string in successive ratios laid the foundation for our Western pitch system. So now let's go to the second one. And you can see where it, that's what a representation, the second, pic, I mean, the third picture. There, you can see it divided in two, then in three, and then in four, and then in five. And so each time he got a different pitch and a, and a higher one because it was a shorter string. If you look at the next one, you can see the different pitches on the scale that he found by dividing it into smaller and smaller pieces. 
first he found the octave, then he found the, the fifth, and then he found. So by the time he got them all there, he got all the half steps of the keyboard um, that you can see if we do the keyboard. We show the next one, I think, is the keyboard. When you brought them down into the same octave, like if it was, if you made it half as fast, you could bring it down an octave into the same. You could have all those pitches and go from the C to the C sharp to D to e, D sharp to E, F, G, and you've had 12 semitones. For our music, we chose seven notes of a scale among those 12, and we called it the diatonic scale, seven notes, with the octave, eight to E, the eighth note would be the one that's twice as fast. Uh, different scales use different selections from those half steps. So that's one, one way we organize our music. So obviously, uh, mathematics is at the fundamental basis of making, creating music as well. Daddy, you have as to understanding. the daddy through. I'm sorry? I heard a voice. Did someone say something? Everybody um, could check to make sure your mics are off. Thank I you. believe my mic is, you couldn't hear me. Oh, no, no. we can hear you. We we're just hearing someone else as well. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where we got um, our seven note scales. And when people are intimidated and, and they, I encourage them to study music theory, I tell them there's seven letters, only seven letters, no big deal. 12 semitones, but seven letters. So we gave them uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then we start over again. And they had they named the different white keys, and the black keys are either flat or sharp, related to the letters and they assigned to the white keys. Um, there's a lot of scales with a lot of different um, combinations out of the twelve, and you can hear a minor and a major scale. But anyway, again, measurements, numbers, and interrelationships. When you think about music, when we create music in our system, we have harmony, which is vertical. We stack notes on top of each other for a chord. And we have it vertical, I mean, uh, horizontal for the melodies. Those two have to get along together. And so one of the one of the challenges of an arranger is to have moving parts that fit in with the harmony, but make it interesting. So you have to be able to cross check. Um, as a personal aside, I ended up doing bookkeeping in Los Angeles when I couldn't find a teaching job for a while. And I was very good apparently at bookkeeping, even though I had no training, <laughs> because you have to cross foot rows of numbers and columns of numbers and have it work out. And I was very used to doing that in music. So the concept was there. I didn't get all the terminology right all the time. I thought black is black is red is, you know, black and red and all that. Um, liabilities were positive. It's like, what? <laughs> but I could understand how to work the number. So um, at any rate, you, you can see where the basis of his dividing the string brought us the pitches that we use today. In other cultures, however, they find different places on the spectrum of the continuousness of a frequency. And if you think, oh, you're changing the frequency as you go, glissando. Other cultures pick different pitches in that spectrum, but that's not our topic today. Anyway, um, one of the other components of sound that uh, musicians need to understand is the concept of timbre, or tone quality, and that also has to deal with acoustics and numbers and measurements. So we have a fundamental frequency, which is a pitch we can identify. But when within each instrument, there's a different picture you can take of the other frequencies that are going on. So those are called partials. So the dominant frequency is what you hear but you can tell the difference between one person's voice or another because there are different other partials going on, different other frequencies that made the sound so rich or so thin. If you hear a flute or if you, if you saw a spectrograph that would do a picture of the flute variate vibrations, you would see a different composite of fundamental and partials. Then you would, if you heard a reed instrument with all those um, oh, here we can move to the next one real quickly. And you can see this is just part of one page of all the different scales and intervals 
that you might have uh, and go to the next, or that's the intervals. And that's the scales. There are scales and modes, and they pick different notes from those things. So now let's look at the next one and talk about Tamu. And you can see that this is a picture of when you took all those fundamentals and the partial put together, you would get a resultant wave like that. So they're very different pictures. A tuning fork is very simple, like a sine wave. A flute, because it's metal and it doesn't have the same number of different pitches going on. But if you have something that's made out of wood, you're gonna have a more complicated set of partials, other frequencies that are less heard. So timbre is very important. And we create that um, with our voice. And we know about that. You can tell when people change their timbre we call it oh, their um, tone quality. If a mother's scolding a child or trying to get them to stop, they're gonna have a different tone quality <laughs> than when they're saying something in terms of endearment. <laughs> so everybody has, you can tell people's inflection affects, um, it ref reflects our emotions. So you can hear horn players that wanna sound like a human voice and they make a sort of breathy warm sound. Warm sound. So timbre is a very interesting part of musical sound and creating it. And it's part, it's a, very much a handmaiden in terms of the emotional quality of your music. Um, but that's something that has to, a lot to do with science. And you can tell that you could go down the rabbit hole and learning about acoustics and the fun and pitch, um, how you can tear apart a pitch and find out what makes it sound like that, particularly um, the timbre. But music also has power. We know about the walls of Jericho, or there was an old TV commercial with Ella Fitzgerald singing a high note and breaking a glass. And uh, one time rehearsing or warming up for a concert in German, in Germany, we were in a beautiful church and a back and in the uh, bathroom there were radiators, and the singers, the three singers, and we were warming up our voice, and the radiators started singing with us. <laughs> because we hit a pitch that they responded to. And if you know anything about um, amplifiers, they have woofers and tweeters. And the woofers are big rubber things with variations of thicknesses that respond to different pitch pitches and amplify them. The tweeters, obviously, are thinner ones, thinner membranes that respond to different pitches. And so the science of making an amplifier is the same kind of idea. But uh, we had, we started playing, two of us were jazz singers, so we started playing with the pitches <laughs> that the radiator was doing. And there's a, a, one of those chimes that are on a base and there are metal tubes hanging down that you put your finger and you hear this very beautiful relationship of all the different notes of the chimes one by one. I had to take it out of my studio because when we sang it, we'd start singing with this. So there's something called sympathetic vibration. But that's because it's moving sound through the air. So that pitch frequency is moving at a frequency that that particular piece of metal or physical thing responds to. And when I teach singing, I say, when you change the shape, you change the sound. So there's a lot of um, components to music involved in science that we don't necessarily think about, um, but it's all what makes it um, so rich and so interesting and so powerful and so evocative to us as human beings. But there's another question having to do with music and science that um, is a debate among two neurophysicists. One, Steven Pinker, calls music auditory cheesecake. When I read that in his book years ago, I shut the book. <laughs> I thought, what? That's not true. And there's another neuroscientist named Daniel Levitin who started out as a sax player in bands, and then he decided to be uh, a studio engineer, which is very complicated and very difficult to do. And then he became a neuroscientist. Maybe not your normal career path, but he's very famous now and he's very, very good. He, he does, he's on a DVD and he has four books that are just fantastic. One of them is This Is Your Brain on Music, which is very interesting. But he definitely contends that music was evolutionary on the path to human language and human evolution. Um, and, you know, that would be a whole lecture in itself between their debate. But many languages, as you know, have built in pitch systems. 
and um, the, it's such a physical phenomenon. And when we were able to have the power of speech, um, music was, I'm sure, part of it. And what they found, an NIH scientist found that our brains are uniquely sensitive to pitches. Uh, it's just part of our being, our makeup, our, our whole, whole anatomical construction. And they found that babies in the womb remember melodies for months. Our hardest bone of the body is in our ear. In jazz, we say we hear with our bones. But indeed, there's a famous percussionist, Glenny, I think is her name, that plays percussion all around the world, and she's deaf, but she plays barefoot. <laughs> so there you go with the bones. Anyway, um, our bodies also have electromagnetic systems, uh, more vibrations, uh, as in Einstein's quote. We have neurons that carry a charge of energy and bits of information jumping across neural pathways in our brain. And from music, neuroscientists have learned a great deal by studying what happens when people are listening to music, when people are playing music, and in, when people are improvising music. There are multiple networks going on in the brain, and they watch what lights up and what dims. Like when they improvise, they notice the reward center went a little crazy, but the inhibition center went dark, <laughs> which just makes perfect sense. So it's called a whole brain activity, music, and not many things are a whole brain activity because it engages both the left and the right hemispheres and in different branches of the brain or parts of the brain are being activated and interact, interreactive. Um, and what they found out is that musicians, there's a corpus callosum, which is a bridge to the two hemispheres, that musicians can have a corpus callosum that's up to 130% larger than normal humans. <laughs> and as I say, I do stress normal humans. And um, so my joke is that sometimes when you see a musician playing, the glazed look is not always drugs. They're actually very engaged. <laughs> so what they do is they focus on the brain using the fMRI functional magnetic resonance interface. And the computer screen can show the electrical charges like little lights that light up. So I always picture a little car on a dark road with its headlights moving along. And uh, they repeatedly describe that kind of engagement by the brain as very beneficial to health. Not only is music a, a very, very important component of therapy uh, for people for illness and injury and pain, but it also is helps rewire the brain. It helps um, people learn how to learn. So um, musicians have to internalize intellectual and mathematical systems to use them artfully. They have to be open to the mysterious flow of ideas uh, that feeds inspiration. And they have to integrate these diverse interrelated systems and formulas in real time when they perform and when they improvise and when they create or invent or compose. So actually, they, be, they get into altered states when they do music. And they're also emotionally involved or it's not very appealing to people listening. One of the things that I think is fascinating about music is that whenever you're engaged in it, listening to it or playing, you're in the now. It brings you into the now. Even if it's a song you've heard before, each experience you have of it is different. More memories, different memories may be engaged or, or triggered. More emotions may come out that you didn't feel before. So music brings you into the now. It's definitely an altered state and it's akin to daydreaming which is one of the states that they link to finding inspiration or getting into a state where you allow new information to come and access the subconscious. There's a woman, um, is her name Herzog, who did a TED talk that they found that 98% of babies have a genius mind, um, but they lose it when they get educated, which is really, really fascinating. And it's because their brains are so open. And I found also that uh, another study that talked about children before puberty are often in the theta state, which is a state you have right before you fall asleep, where you're conscious but not conscious. It's kind of a weird place. And that's why parents get frustrated with them because they're not all there. 
they're in the theta state. So they didn't hear, no, they didn't hear you. They actually didn't hear you, <laughs> literally. So it's very interesting. But that state of mind is one that when Einstein played the violin, he would get into an altered state of mind. And I, I assume he used it for inspiration. Uh, because one of the weird things that he, that he and other scientists talk about is what they call spooky action at a distance. And that's the ability of separated objects to share, share a condition or state. And they did experiments with little baby rabbits in a submarine and a mama on, on land and agitating the little babies and the mama gets upset. They've been able to find, detect spooky action at a distance in the cosmos. So it's, I think that's what's happened when the musicians are playing together and they have rapport. And I've had moments when um, we, someone I played with was open to that state and we altered the, cons the composition or the chord progressions live at the moment. We went, we added four measures together without even making, it, set, without saying anything. And I saw my dear friend, Kenny Barron, who's a NEA jazz master, do a workshop in Stanford. And um, he and his bass player and drummer were doing things for graduate students. And they said, you know, what do you want us to play? Jazz pianist. And they named a song, a standard. And so they said, okay. And they, all they did was tell each other B flat, the key. And they started playing. <laughs> they didn't say the tempo, how fast, who was going to start, what it was, you know, what it was like, whether it was a, a, a swing or a ballad or whatever. Somebody started playing and the others started playing with him. It was uh, outrageous. I thought it's not a, and it wasn't arranged. So there was, that to me is spooky action at a distance, is that rapport that you build from a certain mind state and having the skills that you bring to it to answer and respond and work together. That's why Wynton Marsalis talks a lot about jazz as being a democracy because you have to play together. But if you understand the, and you, I, I think everybody's experienced it with someone that they're very close to that they either just have to look at each other and they know what they're thinking. Or if you've heard, if you turned around and realized somebody was watching you, that to me is a little spooky. So you know, it's something that we're, the studies touch on, but when nobody can, it's, they're very ineffable and very difficult to, to do uh, a, a satisfactory explanation of them. But I think a lot of us experience them. Uh, and one of the things that I find in studying science was that they use the quantum theory without really understanding it or knowing how it works. So I thought, really? <laughs> so, and now they don't have a unified theory because, and that's what they're searching for with the string theories and all that, because Einstein's theories work and then theories that don't work with his theories work. So they don't know how to bridge that gap, but they're finding amazing things. And uh, so they, the thing that I think is more important to think about is that these things, these inventions and tools and devices and equipment that they use to explore the universe were imagined into existence by somebody. They were uh, unrelenting in their questions and their observations and their computation, computations and experiments. And they finally could make their, their ideas manifest. Uh, because of one of these instruments in 1989, the scientists discovered the largest observable structure in the known universe. It was a network, network of galaxies called the Great Wall that's made up of billions of galaxies. So, and now they can detect new stars hidden behind another that they can't see the star they're, they identified, but through the vibrations around the visible star that's called a wobble. So one of, and further, one of Einstein's predictions was black holes, although they couldn't prove it. And I found by accident, or I guess, uh, a clipping I clipped from 2017, and it said the idea that space-time, the very fabric of reality, could jiggle and vibrate in reaction to violent events inside it was the last great unfil unfulfilled prediction of Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity. 
it might be true that such waves have never been seen directly. Um, maybe there's nothing violent enough or whatever, but maybe who's wrong? But in February of 2017, um, the LIGO team announced the rumors were true and suitably cosmic. A pair of black holes had collided invisibly radiating as much energy as all the stars in the observable universe. At hand were not only gravitational waves, the missing notes in Einstein's symphony, but the most intimate details of black holes. Now, this was an adventure that took 40 years. There was a gentleman called um, uh, Weiss, where is he? Um, and he won the Nobel Prize for this work. And he wanted to measure cosmic distances by bouncing a laser beam. It helped him prove the existence of the black holes and it took 40 years but the, for the LIGO. But his journey across decades and leading to a Nobel Prize started when he noticed the hiss on a record, an LP album <laughs> on a turntable. And he realized that gravitational waves acted like just like sound waves and maybe could be detected. So thank you to music again for the science. <laughs> And he successfully tracked the collision of those two giant holes, even though that compression and expanding vibration traveled a billion miles and from billions of years ago. Only the Big Bang was as big. Janice, oh, you're muted. I went ahead and unmute. There okay. you go. Right. I must have touched a key on my computer. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm, I don't know what you didn't hear, but if it's a repetition, I'm sorry. We looked at the mathematical complexity of sound waves and looked at the basic building blocks of music, organized sound. And like the work of physicists, musicians' work involves interact, understanding interactive, interrelated systems and building blocks that are diverse and complicated, a set of known rules on grammar or language. And they have to know how to use these things to create. But I think um, Kaku and Einstein have both referred to the idea of an orchestra. And you have to realize with discrete sections, the violin section, for example, may be playing two melodies, uh, one melody and a harmony. Uh, there's another section, another, all the sections are playing different things, but they're playing together. So it's complex and, excuse me, unified. And someone who writes for it has to understand the resultant, the re results of putting all those pieces together. And the composer and the physicist have to access new ways of organizing information and innovative ways to manipulate the elements. Then they have to have the courage to go ahead and do it. So how do they get these ideas? We can think that it's like the genius child, the babies that are genius are daydreaming, are accessing the subconscious. The, and when you watch, they, there's whole books written about the idea of play and the idea of play meaning you let things happen. Well, musicians play, children play, and they're open to that. And they more and more they say to be healthy, you need to be able to play. You need to be able to let things happen. Lots of times in the studio, I fortunately learning to sing well is to get to the point where you don't feel it, where it's easy. So it's called effortless singing or open throat singing, what I teach. And one time I told a student, who was trying too hard because he just discovered he had matured and his voice was very rich. I, taught, I said, I said, um, Laura, open your, your jaw and to relax it. And then when he did, the sound just sort of escaped and filled the room beautifully. And I, I said, are you not feeling it yet? <laughs> so it was the idea that when he let it happen. So there's something these uh, physicists and are trying to access an ability for us to integrate things that are too hard to understand by themselves. So you can see why I see the um, 
relationship of science to music. And what they say is that, and we can feel them. I, when I was in a hundred voice choir, I could feel the, the vibrations passing through me. So music is a stand next to a set of speakers and hold your ears. But music is vibrations made manifest and everything vibrates. To the physicist, everything vibrates. That's what they talk about, those little string theory where they're just vibrating. And it, whether it's a particle or a wave, even our organs have a frequency. The distance healer, Ed Casey said music would be the healing of the future. And as Pythagoras said, the universe comprises a harmony arising out of numbers. Everything has a frequency. So what Kaku says, the subatomic particles we see in nature, the quarks, the electrons are nothing but musical notes on a tiny vibrating string. Physics is nothing but the laws of harmony that you can write on a vibrating string. The universe is a symphony of strings. So um, once I wrote a lyric, I am no Einstein. I'm not known for debating theories of matter or concept of time. Or whether two bodies can be in one place and have they decided particles or waves. <laughs> But it says, I only know when with you that it basically time stops. And when I'm with you, two becomes one. So that's the basis of the lyric. But so apparently I was foreseeing my, my writing this lecture. <laughs> so I hope you've enjoyed it. And please open up to questions. I hope I haven't gone on too long. And Kaku did very well. Oh, well, let's show the Einstein's thing again just so you can see how it ties together. He says, sound and light waves, walking bundle frequencies, we are souls dressed up in sacred chem biochemical garments. And we are the instruments through which we souls play our music. So there you go. They say it better than I can, but I try. All right, so let's open it up to questions. Thank you so much. Well, oh, I went too long, I think. Did, no, did I? No, I know it didn't. I did it. Oh, goody, 20 minutes left. It's I did well. <laughs> right on time. <laughs> um, we're still waiting for a few, but I had a quick question. I was just wondering yeah. um, what started your initial entry with the relationship between science and music and what inspired you to become a musician? Oh, um, I always think, I think I always wanted to be a musician. My, my parents told me that I stood on a stump at three and asked them to listen to me sing. Um, but it always drew me. I, I wanted to do art or maybe linguistics, but music got a hold of me. And um, I think, well, long, long time ago, for some reason, they gave me the idea of putting, setting up the uh, microphone and speakers and the amp. And so it was like, what? <laughs> uh, what? And so I, of course, if you want to be amplified and be heard, you need speaker systems and all that. But it was all beyond me. Um, but acoustics became fascinating if you're playing in different places. And the different acoustics that you have to deal with, you have to learn, you know, I, like I say, don't get more than four people in Chipotles because it sounds like, a, a, you know, a gang is there because the sound bounces off things and it makes it, it, makes it really loud. Um, so, um, you have to learn a little bit about acoustics and stuff. And once I was a uh, um, usher when I was young in Carnegie Hall, and they made the mistake of carrying a pocket watch on a chain, and you could hear it in the hall. I stood in the back and it was like, <laughs> and I had to cover it with my hand. And I realized the way it's built for acoustics, so you can't get away from it. And um, then when you learn about pitch systems and different instruments all over the world, and they're different tuning systems, you know, where they divide the octave into different places. And uh, if you think of bending a string as a blues player, uh, they're bending the string and adding new uh, dimensions to the frequency and pitch the tuning. So it's hard to escape it if you're serious about it. <laughs> and learning about equal and just temperament. You know, I can't go into that. That's a long explanation. But yesterday, the musician that was playing asked me about that, and I explained it to him, he knew exactly what I was talking about. He was so happy to find out what that, why, why we don't play on harpsichords anymore. And have to, and we, we, we made all the half pitches, the semitones equal in distance instead of where they, how they appear in nature. 
So next question. Thank you. And Does I, that help? Yes. That oh, was okay. So fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Aaron was asking, what would you tell someone that wants to learn about the science of music, but perhaps your family thinks you shouldn't? Oh, well, it all depends on whether um, the science of music will enrich your appreciation of music and your understanding of science. And there's a big push to have people be better at science, number one. Um, but I think when you broaden your knowledge in how things work, you get metaphors. One of the lectures I gave real, a long, long time ago was music as a metaphor. If you learn to do music, if you tackle something that's as complicated as those things, and you grapple with it, um, you're pretty much brave enough to <laughs> to go at other things because you learn how to learn. You have to be humble before things you don't understand. And if you think about learning five finger exercises, um, they found out that people studying piano, for example, um, the ones who did better at, at learning a piece were ones who, it wasn't how many times they repeated things, it was how many times they didn't repeat the errors. And what they found out was the ones who did better were the ones who slowed down to change the errors into the accurate to make it work. And so you have to learn to devils in the details. Artists learn that the devils in the details, the difference between it being right or not. I had someone have to relay a new floor because I had a, two leaks and stuff. And the guy who was laying the floor, I said, you're an artist, because he was very unhappy, unless it was perfect. <laughs> I said, well, you're an artist. I don't like the way that looks. It's bowing a little bit. I go, yeah, you're right. I go, oh, this keeps me up at night, he said. <laughs> it's just a guy laying the floor. So I think learning about sound and science, and there, it's going to make that person more adept at any of the computer sciences, because that's all about details and systems and formulas and languages. So that's my guess, is that it prepares you for a number of different directions to go. Definitely. I remember the first time I ever had to play in a jazz ensemble and solo, and I was terrified for my life. But after that, it was, it's like the most liberating feeling. And oh, my incredible. goodness. Yeah. And you, you just have to keep at it. Um, there's one more story about that, that the, a guitarist, a, a vocal student, was an older person was studying guitar, but he was studying with a 17 year old in Nogales because he was a phenom. And so one day he came and played for the 17 year old. The student was an adult and he's an older guy. And he says, the teacher said, why are you playing so fast? He said, well, you play fast. And this phenom said, I play slow all day long. And I thought, well, that's why he's so good. <laughs> he's paying attention. And he doesn't assume he knows things. He's not trying to get to the other side. He's being there. So music teaches you to pay attention in a way, different way. You can't flub it or you can fake it, but it doesn't work. Yes, yeah. definitely. Um, we have another question. It says, did anything happen in your study of science and the study of the science of music that changed your perspective on life? And I know you talked about that a little bit already, but. Yeah. Um, well, for me, it's, it's exciting to find out that physicists use music as a metaphor. Because I think my challenge is, personally, is that I'm curious about a lot of things. And so I have more books than I'll read in a lifetime. I have more interests than I'll be able to satisfy in a lifetime. And so um, I'm going to be someone who wanders into science and goes, wow. <laughs> And so I read books about physics. I just found it fascinating. They, they're they trying to figure out the universe and the cosmos. Oh, okay. But I could understand their metaphors. So it became, when they get to the mathematical part, I get glazed over, really glazed over. And like, I can't, I don't get it. But I, but I can understand the metaphors. And so that was comforting to me that at least I could grasp things if I, even if I couldn't be a, a, a brainiac in math. So if that qualifies, but it, it affected, I mean, it was comforting to me. That's a, a big deal. And it made me feel like I was better, a better teacher. And that's important that I'm bringing 
their money's worth or the quality of it. <laughs> One of my jokes as a vocal teacher is I nag people and they pay me. <laughs> so relentless. Another, I saw one pop up, but I didn't get to read it. Yes, so it's it sort of related to that. And it was saying, do you believe a science major would benefit from taking music theory classes? Oh, yes, because uh, there's too many overlaps. And a lot of scientists are musicians, and a lot of musicians are scientists. People that are in the arts that are really uh, deep in it, a lot of them are musicians. They may not be performing musicians, uh, but they play and they practice and they see the correlations between science and music. You know, especially if you know, uh, well, like we were talking about the just temperament, temperament work versus equal temperament. Um, and just that phenomenon is just fascinating to learn. If when Pythagoras did that, he did all those notes when he brought them back into the same octave, you know, half step. They weren't equal distant from each other. So in the old days before the piano, in the harpsichord, they had one in a key of G, one in a key of D, and he wrote for those keys because the notes were not the same if you started on a different note. So they shaved a few cents off of them and a few frequency values and made them all equal so you could play in different keys on the same instrument. And that to me was like, what? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Don't say that again. So it was, I thought, oh, nature, what did you do? And that's why if you sing the right, or if you hear a string quartet who don't have frets, they're going to tune differently. And if you're in early music, it's going to sound a little weird to you if you hear early music ensemble, because they're playing more in the temperament before we shave some cents off of, because they measured 100 cents between each half step. So they made, you know, took a few here, added a few there to make them equidistant. I think of a pegboard where you can't hang things on a pegboard if the if the holes are in different distances from each other. You have to, where is it that fits? It's right over there, the third one down and fourth one over where the pegboard fits the tongs. <laughs> okay, next, next, I'll, I'm trying to fire these off. Let's see, there's another question uh, about someone who's new to music. They were asking, what's a starter instrument that can be engaging and challenging and can also help her understand the science of music? Well, um, there's two instruments. A, a piano is wonderful because it's linear. It's laid out in front of you. The, a guitar is portable. So they're both very valuable. And a guitar is a challenge because after you move four, you know, up four frets, you're gonna find a note that's just like the next string. So you have to think it's not as linear in terms of our, our musical system formulas, but the piano, it's in front of you. And so the piano is very good. Uh, and even a cheapy piano, so you can learn the notes and the pitches and the names and scale steps and, excuse me, and then start with simple thirds. Like I say, it's six, seven letters, you know, really. <laughs> it's not 26 letters. And, uh, and chords are vertical and these melodies are horizontal. Once you start, I teach from a need to know thing rather than the classical tradition, like assuming everybody's going to be a classical composer. Um, but um, it's just wonderful to figure it out. And when you, there's such a, that's the thing about music as a metaphor. Um, so that's what I'd recommend because the piano is always comes in good stead, but then the guitar will be easier to understand the system and that you can carry with you. It takes some physical work to get both of them. But um, if you, what happens in music is it's a challenge. You know, you want to play the scale to learn how to play the scale and you don't, it doesn't sound very good or you flub up or your fingers get confused. But eventually if you do it, you can do it. And so you can play the scale. So there's a reward in it. There's the struggle and I don't know how to do this. And then you can do it. So music teaches you that you can, uh, you can deal with the challenge and you can please yourself. You can plunk out. I taught myself to play the piano because I'd been singing when I had played, but I knew where things were and I figured it out and then I could play melodies. <laughs> 
And I saw the letter C over the melody. I thought, that must mean the C chord. So I played the chord. Oh, I can play the harmony. So the discovery was great. I'm still studying it. <laughs> now I'm studying sharp 11s and flat 9s and things like that. But it's just, um, it teaches you. It's a very private thing. And it's like, in, you, in jazz, we call it, you have to go woodshed if you're not good enough. You go off in the woodshed and practice by yourself till you're good enough. And that coming to meet yourself and being honest and humble about what you don't know is very educational. Very, very educational. So music, and it's so personal, it, it gives you the gift of self-expression, which is totally invaluable. So noodle around on the piano too when you start playing it. Don't forget to noodle. Make something up. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, thank you so much. We have two more questions, one from okay. here and then one more from an audience member who would like to ask you directly. So I'll ask this one first. Um, Haley asks, why do certain sounds sound good to us? For example, we might think that a major third sounds better than maybe something that's dissonant like a minor second. So mm. what makes things sound good as opposed to sounding bad? Well, because the 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 um, vibrations are are crashing into each other when there's a dissonance, what we call dissonance. If you picture the vibration, well, just like that. Well, that's a good question because if you look at that, remember the one where the one pump and then two and then three, when the when the curves run into each other, they're they're nodes when they meet. So if there's an octave, and you cut it in half, that's a node, right? So but the, the node at the beginning and the end of the octave vibration is with the one that's half as big. But if you have smaller ones, they get in conflict if they're too close together, but not the same because they're interfering with each other's waves physically. So that's how we hear that dissonance. But in the ear, uh, you know, they rioted at the Rite of Spring by Stravinsky in Paris. They rioted. To us, it sounds tame because we've gotten used to things, you know, so you can get used to it. One of the journeys of a jazz musician is to hear all those odd things that sound dissonant, but you like the, you get used to it and you like it. And in some ways it's, uh, it's richer. It's like understanding um, colors if you liked red and white, but you did, you know, and then you saw blue in it. If you see the different, if you're an artist, you've got to have just so much blue and the red to do where you want to go to with that blend. There's all these different things you can do to make it more red, more orange, more blue, more, you know, you see the variations and the nuances. And that's part of the nuance of music is hearing those dissonances and liking it. And I, I when I had a, my five voice group in LA, I used to, they call them clusters. So there were three notes that are close together. The musicians have to be good to sing those notes that are in dissonance and in tune, not be pulled into the other thing. But the bass player, whenever we hit that chord and we held a note with our dissonances and our clusters, he would put his head back and close his eyes. Because <laughs> he loved that part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so dissonances you can learn to like, you know? And um, it's what we're familiar with, what we grow up with. Uh, so our mind is only as open as we've had a chance to hear things. Um, so it's pretty, it's a lot of subjective things and a lot of attitudes uh, that you inculcate without knowing it or whatever. And, you know, it's like, um, there's a Faulty Towers episode where, where John Cleese is typing up something and listening to, oh, what does he say? Not Beethoven, the Schubert's, one of those, Brahms maybe. And his wife comes in and says, turn off that racket. <laughs> and he says, it's uh, Schubert's ninth racket. <laughs> so what, what she couldn't stand, he, she thought it was noise. He thought it was music. That happens between generations. So sometimes it, but there's a physical thing about the distance, but you can learn to appreciate it. So it's funny. That's a complex question, but I hope that helps. Uh, and you had once, there was another one. Question. Yeah. I have a question. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, 
you were talking about um, a friend or um, somebody who had shattered a glass with their voice. Yes. Um, there's really compelling research, um, I guess, laterally in science with this. So that for that glass to shatter, you have to first identify the tone of the glass, usually by like flicking it or having the glass make some sound. But right. what's been located is the 11th harmonic above that pitch. Exactly. There is really recent and beautifully compelling research in cancer um, research that talks about about how they literally shattering the cells that won't go through apoptosis, which is really something that mastocizes when the cell doesn't die. It just keeps building up. In music, the 11th harmonic is actually breaking that down and it doesn't destroy any of the, the tissues around any localized mass, it's really phenomenal. Well, we've, we've, uh, we're very rudimentary in our understanding of the spectrum of light and sound. That's all you know, I had little treatments, low intensity laser therapy for scar tissue when I had bone spur. And uh, I called the doctors after the operation said, I'm in pain. And he said, oh, that's, you know, they said, oh, that's scar tissue. Excuse me. <laughs> I got the operation to get rid of pain. Yeah. You know, it's like you're supposed to say, oh, okay, I'm not that type. <laughs> you know, Wait a minute. You know, so I found out about laser therapy and, you know, they put a rubber mat on my shoulder and fiddled around on the computer. I thought they could be playing solitaire for all I know. But then, <laughs> but then what they discovered was in the spectrum of light, they do it to horses. Yes. If they're cut, they cauterize them. And what yep. they discovered, this is a story I was told, is that the light spectrum that fell to the side of the wound healed the tissue outside of the womb. So they took that spectrum and made devices out of it to heal tissue, soft tissue. Now, why that isn't available to us? I took, it was really hard to find somebody. He retired. And uh, he took technology. his place, wasn't very good. But Lilt, you don't know, and there's a lot of people that, that use it, but don't understand it well enough to use it correctly or to use it where it would really function. So we've just begun to figure this out. But, you know, there's no, it's not drugs. So there's not a lot of me being poured into it. You know what I mean? So And it's ultimately curative. So then there's Edgar no... Casey said music is going to be the healing of the future. And it is vibrations. And they do entrain them with organs. To, you know, to see if that works, but we're just, it's like the lights are out. We're in the dark room. We don't know what we're doing yet, you know, but that mm -hmm. might be it. And, and then you have to get it to work in society mm -hmm. somehow in politics have to get it politics. funded enough to be functionally and the devices are created and they're working and they're testing or whatever. It's just very, but I, I, I've heard about that and I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. We've just begun to figure it out. And, and um, you know, it took them 40 years to, to detect the vibration of as much energy as was in the, the Big Bang. Oh, it was the energy of that collision of those two black holes was as much as all the uni energy in the universe and all those galaxies and stars. What? Wow. <laughs> so, wow. So anyway. Currents in the distance. Up. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It's I so love cool. that. It's all intertwined. intertwined. Yeah. Exactly. Thank so, you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. I hope that uh, answered it. And I'm glad to hear about that again. Yeah, absolutely. That gives me a little more direction uh, in my purpose and path. So this yeah, is and that's just what, phenomenally oh, affirmative. Well, that's what I think about. And, and there's some people that study that spectrum of, and they create all these weird things, um, sounds and music where they're manipulating that idea of the, the continuum you know, sure, like but binaural to beats and colors, stuff. And colors and light and all that is fascinating. It's like those people that created glasses for people who, who are uh, colorblind. Right. They created glasses and they can see color. It's just amazing. So, there's so much yet to be discovered. In that. Oh, phenomenal! Thank you. Yeah. So, is there anyone else? 
Thank you. Those are the last of our questions, but okay. I just wanted to thank you so much. That was so fascinating. I feel like we could have like a discussion with like tea and coffee for like oh. until 12 in the morning about oh, this. Definitely. It is fascinating. And everybody has some experience yeah. in touch with something like this, something that happened that, uh, you know, created their awareness of uh, potentials that we are just beginning to find. Yes, so. definitely. I mean, no pun intended, but it resonates with everyone, I feel like. Um, Everything vibrates, even those little bitty atoms. I use, I always say, uh, uh, there's no inanimate object. <laughs> Everything's a dancing universe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so why not dance? I love that. And sing. Thank you. Thank you all for coming to hear this. I hope I didn't um, confuse you or, or not explain things well. But I did, did what I could. <laughs> I'm still grappling. Thank you. No, thank you so much. And just for our students, please don't forget to fill out the evaluation form for attendance. Um, and and the Humanities all... Council likes to, yeah. to get feedback. Yeah, yes, me so too. If you, um, <laughs> um, Janice, if you want to drop down in the chat where they can give feedback if you want them to give feedback for that or if you want to put an email or contact in there i can give an email um question. sure know how to do that where is um, it that little people thing yes if you i can actually type it for you, or you can okay it in. it's jjj okay a z z a z z at mac mac.com jjazz okay. jjazz <laughs> I or think I had a group JJ Jazz, Janice Jarrett Jazz at okay. Mac, MAC.com. That person might have had four J's. Sorry about that. No, but just three. <laughs> it's in the chat now. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Janice. And thank you to everyone who attended this event. We're yes, so happy you came. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.